All right. Uh, what is meant by free will? What, what do people mean in popular usage when they talk about free will? Yeah, I mean, everybody has a free will. They just mean that you can do what you want. You can, um, I, I can do what I choose to do. Um, I'm going to argue that I don't, I don't think that's that far from what we mean in the confession, uh, as I hope to explain. Um, so in, in, in terms of the three, three different senses in which I, wa I want to talk about, one is the popular usage, I do what I choose to do. The second is a Pelagian sense of free will. They would say, by nature, we have the ability to do whatever it is we want to do, including choose God, choose obedience, obey the commandments, believe the gospel. We have the natural ability. The Arminians say, uh, because of prevenient grace, which is universally distributed, all people have the ability to respond positively to the gospel, to believe it, and to obey the commands of God. What the confession says is that by free will, we mean that all people have the capacity to choose and the responsibility to choose but in terms of choosing God, that, that we are in bondage. So I want to try to flesh that out uh, by reading what the confession and trying to explain what exactly it means by what it says. Uh, God hath to do the will of man with that natural liberty, natural ability, that is neither force nor by any absolute necessity of nature determined to good or evil. In other words, we're not puppets on a string. Uh, we're not being compelled by forces outside of us to do one thing or um, another or even internally to do one thing or another. So we have the, in other words, we have the natural ability to choose. And so then it says the man in his state of innocency, so this is Adam in the garden, had freedom and power to will and to do that which was good and well-pleasing to God, but yet mutably so that he might fall from it. He could choose to obey. He could choose not to obey. He could choose to believe. He could choose not to believe. It was a true test. It was a true test. So that, and look, see what it says again. Um, he had the freedom and power to will and to do that which was good and well-pleasing to God, but yet mutably, so that he could, he could fall from that condition of innocence. So number three, man by his fall into a state of sin hath wholly lost all ability of will to any spiritual good accompanying salvation. So as a natural man, being altogether averse from that good and dead in sin, is not able by his own strength to convert himself or to prepare himself thereunto. So we have lost the capacity to do good. We have lost the capacity to believe God and to please God, to repent of our sins and put our trust in Christ. We are in bondage. So this is, this is the Reformation debate that goes back to Luther and Erasmus. Luther, Erasmus writes a treatise on the freedom of the will and Luther responds with a work, bondage of the will. We are in bondage to the world, the flesh, and the devil. And it's only by the, 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 the power of God's grace that we would ever be able to respond positively to what he requires of us. Terry, was it part of the Arminian thought that the mind was not fallen or corrupted or somehow, um, in other words, the point in uh, Calvinism of total depravity means that we are corrupted in all parts, every, every part of us is, it was <clears throat> somehow I, I, I'm thinking that the Arminians thought, no, your mind is still good enough to hear, decide, uh, it's not it's not corrupted. It's not. Uh, Some yeah. Right. Well, I, th I think um, at one time or another, there has been one group or another who has wanted to say that there was some aspect of human nature that was not corrupted by the fall, so that you could trust your emotions. So today, it's the emotions. Follow your heart. 
I think a Christian is going to be very skeptical about that sentiment. Follow your heart. Um, who remembers? All right, this will test, I think, maybe Andy and Charlie, some others. Who sang, it can't be wrong if it feels so right? <laughs> Debbie Boone. Debbie Boone. <laughs> top, top of the charts for weeks. It can't be wrong if it feels so right. And Christians were saying, oh, she's singing that to the Lord. <laughs> to which I felt, I don't care who she's singing it to, that's, that's a bad idea that it can't be wrong. If it, like, as though you're, somehow your emotions are an, an infallible gauge of what's good and right and proper and right. No. So uh, how about the mind? I mean, there's been those who have wanted to argue the mind is not corrupted by sin, that it has the capacity to rationally evaluate and come to right conclusions, as opposed to it being biased by evil. Uh, the will, do you have the capacity to choose right uh, from wrong? Well, the will also is corrupted by the fallen nature. So uh, that the three in tandem um, are thoroughly corrupted by sin. Yes? You're saying that even though that it's, Salvation is given to us, as like Jesus said in, in what was it, Matthew 28 or 29, that like all the land, all the people come to me, we literally, without the work of the Holy Spirit, cannot make cannot. that decision. Natural man, 1 Corinthians 2, 14, cannot understand the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness to him. Jesus says, no one can come to me unless the Father draws him. So we'll, we'll line up a whole bunch of verses like that. Well, that's just repeated over and over again. We don't have the capacity. Are we still responsible for our bad choices and our unbelief? Yes. So again, that's where, the, uh, the, where we can't reconcile the things that differ. Ben? A uh, question that is hypothetical, so maybe not worth getting into. But we talked about the, the work of Adam being like a true test uh, where he truly did have free will. If Adam had like passed that would then like would that same test have applied to the next generations, or like would it have been you continue what test or would it just have been perfect? For no, I think he was representative man, yeah, yeah. and so as as our representative, he would have secured salvation for his progeny. But would, it, would he have ever died? No. So he would. So the test would be ongoing. No, no, I think it was a probation. It, it was a testing period, and if he had passed the period, he would have secured salvation. There was no instruction regarding the tree of life until, you know, man has fallen, he's become like us. Yeah. we got to kick him out, otherwise he'll leave, leave live forever in the state. Okay, paragraph four, when God converts a sinner and translates him into the state of grace, he freeth him from his natural bondage under sin, and by his grace alone enables mm -hmm. him freely to will and to do that which is spiritually good. Yet so, as, by, as that by reason of his remaining corruption, he doth not perfectly nor only will that which is good, but doth also that which is evil. And then five, uh, the will of man is made perfectly and immutably free to good alone in, a, in the state of glory only. Uh, so... Here's what we are seeing. Um, so I have the, the statement from Providence up here just to remind us that the foreknowledge, decrees of God, predestination, and all of that does not, um, does not cancel out the reality of the necessity of second causes which fall out, as it says, necessarily freely or contingently. So the confession is taking us through state of innocence. There was free will. You know, Adam could choose right. Adam could choose what's wrong. The, the fall then, free will is then lost, which is why even though I think as it's popularly used, we can understand what's being said, I think it's a term that we should avoid using. I think we should not talk about people having a free will. It creates the wrong impression. The, the, we have a problem. The problem is bondage. So here's, here's going back to Confession, uh, chapter 6, 1, our first parents being seduced by the subtlety and temptation of Satan's sin and eating the forbidden fruit. This their sin, God was pleased, according to wise and holy counsel, to permit, having purpose, to order it to his own glory. 
consequences. Uh, Romans 5, 6, while we were still weak or helpless, at the right time Christ died for us. What's the human condition? It's one of weakness. It's one of the New American Standard. It's helplessness. Romans 8, 7, the mind set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to the law, law of God. Indeed, it cannot. Oops. There's an ability. It does not submit. The mind set on the flesh. In other words, humanity in an unregenerate state, that's the mind set on the flesh. Unregenerated, in a natural condition, is what? It's in a natural state of hostility toward God. Not indifference, not neutrality. We are born, uh, Romans 1.32, we are haters of God by nature. We're hostile toward God. We are lovers of darkness. That's the human condition. Uh, and, and in this state, we are in bondage. We have lost the ability uh, to obey God and to please God. Um, Jesus says, John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. There is total inability. There's none righteous, Romans 3, no, not one. No one who understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. So this whole idea that people are seeking, you know, innocently seeking, groping, hoping to find God, no. Not by nature. But not by nature we're seeking him. If we're seeking him, it's because he sought us. Uh, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Repeated in Colossians 2.13. That's the human condition. Is one of spiritual death. Dead people are unresponsive. Dead people are blind. Dead people um, have no life in themselves. No spiritual life. No, uh, no capacity to generate that life within themselves. Uh, jo Jesus, John 6, 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Again, John 6, 65, therefore I have said to you, no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my Father. You see the, the inability? We don't have the capacity. We have lost it. We don't have the ability or the inclination. Both of those things are true. Uh, there's uh, the verse quoted earlier, 1 Corinthians 2.14, natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. They're folly to him, and he is not able to understand them. Why? Because they're spiritually discerned. Uh, Colossians 1.13, he's delivered us from the domain of darkness. Where are we by nature? We're in a, the, the domain of darkness. And we love the darkness. That's the problem. John 3, we love the darkness. So we don't have the ability, we don't have the inclination, we don't have the desire. Uh, to, um, to please uh, uh, and to obey God. Um, Where was that last scripture? Colossians 1.13. All right, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. That's the human condition. It's bondage. It's, 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 uh, it's slavery. Uh, then for a state of grace, uh, Romans uh, 6, 5, and 6, for if we have been united with him in a death like his, we, will, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that the old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. So what were we? We were enslaved. What does God's grace in Christ do, brings us out of that slavery, out of that bondage, liberates us. Jesus said, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Um, uh, the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh, for these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. So that, as the confession says, we're not, the, the, the remnants of sin remain, and we fight with those for the rest of our lives. So, the bondage has been broken, but the dregs of sin remain, which means that there is a battle for the rest of our lives. Uh, uh, Romans 7, the Apostle Paul, um, I, uh, this is as strong a description of what that, that battle is like. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want to, uh, I agree with the law that it is good, so now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me, for I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. 
For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. So I find to be... I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand, for I delight in the law of God in my inner being. See? Yes, I agree with the Bible. I, it's true, but I see this. My, my, my member is another, war waging, another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my me- members. Wretched man that I am, who can set me free from this body of death? So let me just digress for a minute and talk about Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards' treatise on the freedom of the will. After he was kicked out of his church in uh, Northampton, uh, Massachusetts, he went to Stockbridge, which was a a, a mission to the Indians. And it was there that he wrote his great uh, theological philosophical treatises. So he wrote one on justification by faith. He wrote another one on the freedom of the will. This, I think, helps to understand the confession and what we mean by what we're saying. Freedom of the will. What, our, what Edwards argues is we always, always, always do what we want. In that sense, the will is free. You are always doing what you, exactly what you want to do. So let's take the extreme example where it seems not to be the case. The teller at the bank has got a gun at her head. And, and, and the bad guy is saying, hand over the money. When she hands over the money, is she doing what she wants to do? Yes, she is. Yes, she is. She wants to live. She, she wants to live. To so given the options, she wants to live. She hands over the money. That's better than a bullet in her head. So this is Edward's point. The problem with humanity is, as we look at each of these four states and, and try to understand the connection with the will, is that is what we want. So after the garden, what do we want? We want what is evil. We either want um, evil or good for evil reasons. So we are at the the same time in bondage to evil because our nature is evil, because we're by nature corrupt. So because our nature is corrupt, we're going to choose the evil, but we're freely choosing it because that's what we want, because we're lovers of darkness. Yes? Are we by nature corrupt or is our nature corrupt? I, I don't, I'm, those are synonymous for me. Our nature is corrupt. We are by nature corrupt. I'm, you know, the, the human condition is one of corruption. And, and so we, we, uh, we uh, you know, whether you are, um, well, really, whether you're Adam in the garden, in a state of corruption, in a state of redemption, or, or in glory, we are always doing what we want to do. Okay? So Adam had that free will. He, he, For time he wanted to obey, then he wanted to to disobey, and so he did. In a state of corruption, we wanted we do what we want. What do we want? We want the corrupt things. We want the sin. So I, you know, I I I I I know uh, people who have got it up here. They'll argue theologically. They got it in here. They kind of are moved by hymns, but they like the sin. That's so they choose to sin. They like it. They want it. So that forms their, their choices. Or they choose what's right for evil reasons. So we're always, whatever our condition is, innocence, innocent sin, grace, glory, we are always doing what we want. What we are not free to do is to choose our wants. Wants are determined by our nature. Even the Christian has to Absolutely. Do they want to be obedient to God? Yes. But what do they want more? Yeah. They want, they want the sin. More. Absolutely. When I say they, I'm talking about myself.
Are you saying that's my story? Write that down for me, would you, Neil? <laughs> <coughs> okay, so if this helps, if Edwards helps, you use that. I, th I think it really gave, gives me a handle on things about how we can say that we are, you know, we do freely choose what we do and at the same time we're in bondage. We're in bondage because what we want is evil because that's our nature. So that's the whole bent of our personalities. Okay, so. It's also really convicting because it, it doesn't let us move to God. Well, I didn't really want to do that. Yes, you did. Yeah. Or you wouldn't have done it. Or that wasn't me. Yeah. That, 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 that was a thing a few years ago, wasn't it? Yeah. The devil made me do it, Flip Wilson. <laughs> Yeah, well, that was really a thing. I mean, that's not that you know that 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 wasn't me. That that isn't who I that isn't who I am. That's become a yeah. But really, it is. That is who we are. I, yeah. I want to lose weight. Apparently, I want to eat gold more. Okay, let's look at the posses and the picaris and see if this doesn't uh, uh, answer answer some things for you. So th these are Latin words, you know, for um, what's possible, posse, and then uh, picari is soon, in innocence, it was posse picari, posse non picari, possible to sin, possible not to sin, for Adam. In, in a state of sin, it is non posse, non picari, not possible not to sin. We are always sinning. We're either doing what's wrong or we're doing what's right for the wrong reason. Uh, grace, posse picari, posse non picari. We're back halfway to, to innocence where it's possible to sin and possible not to sin. Glory, in glory, it, our condition will be non posse picari, not possible to sin. We will be confirmed in righteousness so that sin will no longer have any traction. We will be so transformed by grace that, um, that there will be no, uh, no point of contact for evil, no traction in our own souls. It will be, for us as it was for Jesus, it will be totally repulsive. It'll be like being invited to have a cup of vomit. It will be something we will not have any desire for whatsoever. So it will, uh, th 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 it will have no appeal. It will rather be repulsive to us. The idea of sinning against God, defying God, um, uh, you know, launching out on our own path. No, we will want to please him and honor him and serve him. That will be our delight. That will be what we want above all else. So, those are your posses and your picaris. When does that happen? When does that? When when does that happen? Uh, and the fullness of redemption is on the last day when the body and soul are joined together. It it happens in an, an interim sense when our souls go into heaven, and our bodies go into the ground. But redemption is not yet complete at that point, though we are in heaven. And the other answer is not soon enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not soon enough. All right, um, let's see, what's question number? Now we go on to effectual call. Number nine, what is effectual call? What abilities does God give to us by his effectual call? There we go. What do we contribute? sin that may be necessary. Um, but to, to answer the call, God, God does all the work. We respond as we have been able to do by him. And only as we have been able to do by him. So an another, another word for effectual call is regeneration. Okay, this is, so the, in typical in the discussion, there's a difference between the general call or universal call that's a gospel proclamation. That, can, that goes out to all humanity. Or think of an arena full of people and you're presenting the gospel and calling people to Christ. That's uh, the, the general call. The effectual call is the, is the call that actually brings about the thing that it requires. So it affects, it brings about the outcome for which it is calling. So in the pro think in terms of um, Ezekiel 37, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. That's an effectual call. Because as a result of, of saying, oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord, the bones come to life through that proclamation. I think it's the greatest picture of what gospel preaching is all about. 
Uh, so tying the, some of these themes together, dry bones. In the Hebrew, it says very, very dry. All right, they are bleached. They are uh, the, the, even in, in the marrow, there's no moisture left. These are old, dead, dry bones. There's a field of them. And Ezekiel's told to go in and to do what would, you would presume to be the most futile thing that you could possibly do, which is preach to a field of dry bones. And as he does, what happens? You know, the ankle bones connect to the, yeah. you know. <laughs> and th th they come to life. Uh, that's gospel preaching. It's the, that's the effectual call. And, and, and the language that is being used here, I think the reason why they chose uh, effectual call rather than regeneration, though, though I treat them synonymously, is that it, the, going back to Romans 8, 29, and 30, those whom he called, he predestined, he predestined, he justified, glorified, and so forth. So, that's, uh, so, so this, is, this, is, this is the transformation of the sinner through the call of the gospel to that sinner to believe, repent and believe. So here's the language of the confession. All those whom God hath predestinated unto, unto life and only those uh, he is pleased and has appointed an accepted time effectually to call by his word and spirit so this is a very Presbyterian uh, combination. We keep these, thing, these two connected. Uh, I think it's vital. You know, you're not, you're not, with word without spirit, you're going to end up with you know, dry bones. Um, sp uh, sp spirit without word, you're going to end up with chaos. So you, uh, uh, you disconnect. The spirit from the word, then there's no telling where you're going to end up. So, and, and, and as, I as, as I was saying uh, um, uh, uh, early, earlier, what the Holy Spirit does is that the Holy Spirit takes the benefits of Christ, working through the word, applies them across all that space and time. The spirit and the word, keep them together, word and spirit, always. So, by his word and spirit, out of the state of sin and death in which they are by nature, to grace and salvation by Jesus Christ, enlightening their minds spiritually and savingly to understand the things of God, which we just saw, 1 Corinthians 2.14, by nature we do not understand the things of the Spirit of God. Uh, taking away their heart of stone, that's, uh, you know, that's uh, from the Old Testament prophets, and giving them a heart of flesh, renewing their wills by his almighty power, determining them to that which is good and effectually drawing them to Jesus Christ, yet so as they come most freely, being made most willing by his grace. This is one of the great clauses in all confessional literature, in my opinion. They come most freely. Again, back to the, the question of the will. They've been changed. So they've got this new mind. They've got this new will. They've got this new heart. And so they, 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 they have a different taste, different desires, different interests, different passions. So they come most freely because, because of the change of nature. Now God is desirable. The gospel rings true. They understand they're a sinner. They, ne they need to repent of that sin and be done with that sin and receive salvation. And so they, they come freely because they've been loosened from the bondage and from the darkness of sin. Having been made willing, they would never have otherwise come to him but made willing by his grace. Uh, two, this is uh, effectual call is of God's free and special grace alone, not from anything at all foreseen in man who was altogether passive therein until being quickened and renewed by the Holy Spirit, he is thereby enabled to answer this call and to embrace the grace offered and conveyed in it. So then and only then is he enabled to answer the call. So what is effectual call? You know, it, it, is, it is the divine initiative. Uh, it, is, it, it is God through gospel proclamation transforming the sinner, regenerating uh, that heart and, and, and taking out the heart of stone and putting in the heart of flesh and, 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 and creating a receptivity within that sinner to hear the gospel message and positively to respond to it. What abilities does God give by the effectual call? You know, the ability to understand, the, 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 you know, the, the, 
the understanding of the mind, the, 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 uh, uh, the delight of the affections, and, and the, the movement of the will. So, you know, where, how are we affected by sin? Mind, will, and emotions. What does regeneration do? It transforms mind, will, and emotions. What do we contribute? In this, in this category, absolutely nothing. We are all together passive. You see that? All together passive therein. We are acted upon. We contribute nothing. Uh, why? Because we were lovers of darkness. There's none who seeks for God. We just saw this in Romans 3. We were not seeking for God. He sought us. Uh, I think it's Luther who referred to the Holy Spirit as the hound of heaven. He, he pursued us. And apart from that pursuit, we would never, never have taken an interest. We would never have uh, uh, responded in, in, a, in a positive way to the proclamation of the gospel. Number 10, what can be said of man's best efforts apart from the effectual call? So paragraph 4, others not elected, although they may be called by the ministry of the word and may have some co common operations of the spirit. There's that little root of common grace. Little hint of common grace, operations of the spirit, and it's citing, for example, Hebrews 6, among other passages. Um, Although they may be called by the ministry of the word, may have some copper, common operations of the spirit, yet they never truly come unto Christ and therefore cannot be saved, much less can men not professing the Christian religion be saved in any other way whatsoever, be they never so diligent, we read this earlier, to frame their lives according to the light of nature and the law of that religion they do profess and to assert and maintain that they may is very pernicious. So that's what the confession thinks of you if you have that opinion. You're very pernicious and you are to be detested. So apparently the writers of the confession thought this was a doctrine to be carefully guarded and protected. Uh, so let's see, question number nine. So re reinforcing what, uh, what uh, they're saying, let's just look at some of these passages. Jesus says, unless you are born again, you cannot see, you will not see, you will not understand, you will not grasp, you will not enter the kingdom of God. Nicodemus is baffled. How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say you must be born again. And then, as for the divine initiative, the wind blows where it wishes. And you hear it sound. This is why I, you know, I this is why I and other Reformed people disagree with a title that Billy Graham gave to a book years ago, How to Be Born Again. You don't how to be born again. The wind blows where it wishes. That's what that's the analogy for the movement of the spirit. It's not it's outside of our control. This is not something that we, we are able to manipulate. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. We, we, we are not able to, to control that. Um, and, and the same thing is said by Jesus, rather said by John, who is interpreting Jesus' ministry when he says that uh, to as many as did receive him, so there's, there's, the, there's the human initiative, I, receiving him, who believed in his name. That's our part, as it were. He gave the right to become children of God who were born. And I, in other words, previously born, and that's why they believed, and that's why they received him, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man but of God. You were born again, not because of the exercise of your will, not for some power that you have in your flesh, that is in your, uh, your ordinary human nature. No, but you were born of God. It was his, his, his initiative. Effectual call is, is entirely a matter of divine initiative. The result is, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. We had to be 
recreated entirely. To be, we had to become new people. The old's passed away. Behold, the new has come. Uh, Ephesians 2, and then verses 4 and 5. You were dead, that's the human condition, in trespasses and sin, but God. Have you ever heard the Lloyd-Jones sermon, But God? That's the title of it, But God. Um, fantastic. He says these are two most important words in the whole Bible. But God. <laughs> You were dead, but, but what made the difference? Well, I was, I was so intelligent. I was so smart. I, 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 weighed, the, I weighed the evidence. I, I, um, you know, there was this element of goodness in me that, uh, you know, unlike my friends who didn't believe, you know, I believed, and that's, uh, that's because I'm a virtuous person, or, because, uh, or I'm, I'm smarter than they are, or I have more wisdom than they do. Uh, no, uh, but God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we, when we were dead, there was nothing to commend us. We were dead in our trespasses. There was no virtue that he saw or foresaw. Made us alive. It's totally sovereign initiative. He made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. All right, for the called language, why effectual called? Here's the general call. Many are called, but few are chosen. So there's the difference between the many and the few. This is the general call, there's the effectual call, and the call language in Romans 8, 29, and 30. Um, what can be said about our best efforts apart from the effectual call? Not much. Very pernicious to be detested. Yeah, they're, they're going to fall short. So you have these ominous, you know, warnings Matthew 7, 22, on that day many will say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name or cast out demons in your name and do mighty works? And look at all these good things that we did. And he says, depart from me, I never knew you, you workers of iniquity, lawlessness. Uh, Matthew 13, you know, the seed is sown on the rocky soil. It hears the word, immediately receives it with joy. But and because of the pressures of persecution and so forth, uh, the word is choked out. And in, especially uh, ominous, Hebrews 6, 4, and 5, it's impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who've tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tested the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come and, and then fall away. Um, so what can be said of man's best efforts apart from the effectual call? They are f they are, it's futility. They fall short. They're corrupt. Um, uh, they are inadequate. Okay, we got to go, and I got to go. I am leaving for Texas in the morning. I will be preaching in Amarilla. Amarilla.